Brice, the floor Thank is you. yours. Thank you, Natalie. Thanks for uh, everybody joining us today for this uh, session on uh, risk communication in the uh, digital and fake news age. As you know, this session is part of the international symposium organized by ANSES, and uh, it's just one of the, the many uh, sessions that have been ongoing over the past few weeks, and I will continue after this week uh, on uh, topics related to expertise and, uh, and democracy. Well, I'm Brice Laurent. I work at the uh, Center for the Sociology of Innovation at MinParisTech, and I'm very glad to uh, chair the session today. Uh, we'll be talking about the uh, relationships between expertise, and particularly expertise about risk, relationship between expertise and society, and we'll focus uh, on the current transformations that are introduced uh, by the use of digital tools. Uh, I think one important point to uh, to, um, to stress at the beginning of this session is that we're trying to get to a sophisticated understanding of risk communication, so to speak. We do not want to take uh, risk communication for granted because, as many of you are aware, of course there is a risk, so to speak, of the notion of risk communication. It's the risk of thinking that issues are just about messaging, that issues are just about finding the right communication tools for um, diffusing a scientific fact that would be unquestioned. Of course, we are living in a situation where issues are, are much more problematic because of crisis, because of uncertainties, uh, and because scientific issues are intermingled with other uh, issues, about issues related to um, economic costs, related to social priorities, related to um, lots of democratic questioning. So the questions we're going to ask today uh, are about what kind of facts, what kind of, what kind of information uh, circulates online and to whom? Um, what is convincing to whom for, for those uh, looking at those information online? Uh, what is used uh, and by whom and to do, to do what? And at what uh, conditions, particularly of what uh, in institutional conditions, are um, are facts circulated online considered credible by those who, who, who read and who read about them and, and see them? So today we'll be uh, hearing uh, three speakers, and we'll reserve some some time for uh, some time for uh, discussion. So do not hesitate to uh, to contribute to to the conversation by writing your comments or questions uh, in using the um, the chat box. Um, you can write as the presentations go, go along and we'll synthesize those, uh, those comments and questions and report them back to, uh, to, to the presenters. We'll, use, uh, we'll, we'll give each presenter about 20-25 minutes for presentation, then we'll spend a bit of time for discussing each of the three uh, presentations. We'll then have hopefully about a half hour for uh, a, general, uh, a general discussion. Just a small point about the, the session, it's in English. Um, there is uh, an available translation for those who are in French, for those who prefer to hear the session in French. Um, you can feel free to, to write your, uh, your comments or questions in English or in French if, uh, if needed, and we'll try to, uh, to, to work on, on both, both languages to give the questions back to, to the presenter. So we will start the, uh, the, the session by hearing a, a presentation by Dominique Cardon. Uh, Dominique is professor, at, uh, is professor of sociology at, uh, at Sciences Po. He's, he's the uh, uh, director of the Media Lab. He's a, a well-known specialist of digital practices and, and the politics of the internet. He's worked on the issues, issues related to big data, digital media, and the uh, online circulation of news. Well, Dominique, the, the floor is yours. And thanks again for, for being here today. So, hello to uh, everybody. Many, many thanks for the invitation to this uh, discussion. I hope everything is correct, but it seems correct for me. So, <clears throat> I will present you um, a very broad uh, research on the digital shift in the uh, French public sphere and with the idea that it could help us for our discussion about risk communication, but I won't talk a lot about risk communication. It, it, it could help us for the discussion to have this kind of 
broad picture of the kind of research that we can do with, <clears throat> let's say, computational social science. And it's a work that has been done by many researchers at the Media Lab at Sciences Po. Uh, so it's not my, my own research, but it's a research that it's a collective research that has been done by Jean-Philippe Cointet, Benjamin Hock, Tabanou, Guillaume Plic, and Pedro Ramacciotti. So uh, let's just begin by uh, an idea of this research that is a, 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 a comparison between the situation of the digital media in France and in the US. In and it's a work that is parallel and done with the uh, Bergman Klein Center and Yochai Yo Yo Benkler at Harvard uh, using the same kind of methodology in order to have a broad picture of the media sphere in the two countries. So let's say that our argument and part of the argument is that when we are discussing about disinformation, fake news, filter bubble, polarization and many uh, new phenomena that occur on the web, we are always looking at a very local situation with one story, one group of people are looking at one specific um, uh, things that is happening on one platform. So our idea is that we lack of a kind of global map, a structural representation of the digital sphere, and it's important to, to, to get this rep architecture or representation of the public sphere uh, because um, um, we have always the idea that digital world is something that is quite wild, um, chaotic, uh, and we couldn't understand what are the viral di dissemination of information, but it still have a structure. So our idea is to show, I will try to show you that uh, we still have a structure, and as soon as we get the idea that there is a structure in the digital circulation of information, we also could have a better understanding of the disinformation phenomenon and uh, the circulation of fake news. So let's say that our model is quite naive and it's very simplistic and in a certain way it's just a proxy in order to get different data set of information. So it's a three layers model that we could see on this, on this slide with the idea that we have at the top of the map or the architecture, we have the layer of the authority. authority as a kind of acknowledgement or centrality or um, authority of different sources of information coming from, most of the time, but not always, coming from um, the professional journalist. And one way to get data on this question is to see, to create uh, a set of different media and to find the hypertext links between the article of different media outlets on this digital sphere. Then we could add a second layer of uh, the circulation of information and we call this layer the layer of influence and we use data coming from Twitter because on Twitter we don't have a representative part of the population, it's just a small part of 10, between 10 to 15 percent of the internet users are sharing information on Twitter, but they are sharing link of articles that are coming from the uh, um, website of the authority. So we have this kind of influence sphere where information could be shared by an enlarged public sphere of uh, Twitter users. And then at the bottom of our representation, the bottom is not the, the, the best um, way to, to, to define it um, is the conversation layer and in the conversation layer we use data from coming from Facebook because it's more mundane, it's more uh, the daily life of many peoples and we have a, a larger and more representative part of the population that are sharing information in very small uh, sphere in, in this uh, um, construction. So let's say that with those three different layers we could try to produce something as a representation, it's a 
something that has been constructed, it could be discussed, and I'm sure you will discuss it, of the digital public sphere. So in, in the work that we've done, we, we uh, define uh, 460 French media. Those media could be very important, central, newspaper, radio and TV channels that are at the center of the professional world of the uh, French media sphere, but it could, could also be a local journal or a lot of websites um, that are linked to in the production of information, but could be sometimes very small website with a small visibility on part of the disinformation uh, um, articles are coming from those uh, part of the of the um, uh, yes of, of the of the of our corpus. Um, if we look at so we have the the circle here is the representation of all those um, uh, media that we have in the corpus, and we try to uh, capture all the hypertext link, linking one article coming from one media outlet to one article coming to another media outlet. Part of the information here in hypertext link is the fact that it's an asymmetric and a direct network because the article A cite article B, so it's a link from A to B, but not from B to A. So we have a direction in the link. And because there is a direction, there is a hierarchy, and a hierarchical structure in the organization of this media sphere. So we could see that we have three different clusters of media in the digital, in the French digital media sphere. Here we could have two different clusters, the green and the violet, at, that we could define at the center of the media sphere. It's the most important. Uh, French newspaper, radio and TV channel that are present. Here, radio and TV and here, magazine and newspaper are present. Then we have another part of different media here on, in those clusters. We could say that it's a niche media, it's more magazine, specialized uh, magazine, and I won't speak about them. And then we have the periphery or the counter informational space, where the more problematic and discussed uh, media outlets in the French public sphere. We have two different dimensions in this representation with far, far left and far right uh, media outlets. And then this important part of the, let's say, counter-informational space of the uh, French um, digital space, where we have a lot of blogs, a lot of websites, a lot of um, YouTube channels coming from most of the time, the far right are very polarized or ideological position in the um, political spectrum. So with this representation, we could get a better representation, which is this one. And this one is important for us because it shows us that even if we have always the idea that a network of link is something that is flat, <laughs> it's in fact very hierarchical and there is a strong organization of the circulation of information if we look at the hypertext links between articles in media. So here we have the center, the core here, here we have the niche and here we have the counter informational space that we call here the periphery. So the two important part of this graph is this one and this one. And if we could, if we look at the direction of the link, we see that media coming that are part of the center of the informational space, cite other media also part of this uh, center of the informational space. They are cited by all the other part of the, corp of the data set, but they never cite any kind of um, uh, other media. So they receive some link, but they don't uh, answer in responding and inciting the other. So we have this kind of selective apparent that appears in this representation. And that's the reason why we have this kind of very hierarchical organization of the structure of the media in France. We could see the same phenomenon if we are looking at the second layers of our uh, model with the influence on Twitter. And if we look at the, the French media 
that have been cited by Twitter account that share an article from the media A and an article from the media B. In this case, we it's a co-citation network. In this case, we are joining together the two media because they have been cited by the same Twitter account and we're doing that with millions of Twitter accounts in France. We have this map and on this map I won't have time to, to enter into the detail of this map but we have the same representation. Here we have the center media of the, uh, the French uh, media sphere with traditional BFM, Le Monde, France Info and part of this graph here we have the more leftist or center-left French media and we are we have another cluster of media here with let's say the counter-informational space with more politicized, ideological and uh, um, counter-informational uh, outlets that are part of the production of uh, disinformation in the French public sphere. So let's say that I show this result very quickly but our main idea is to uh, show that um, in the debate about this information, we always have the feeling that a, a small website with a very small wi wi visibility is able to bring into this, the center of the debate some information that could uh, engage mistrust or um, about the information. It's not the case. In fact, we still have a very uh, vertical and hierarchical organization of the information. We could see this when we gather many information of the different layers of our model. So if we have, if we have on this uh, graph the center, the politicized media on the left and on the, on the right and on the left, and then we have the counter-informational space called periphery here with uh, a lot of um, website coming from the far right in this in this space and if we look at the number of articles, the number of share on Facebook, the audience of the web of the website, the number of share on Twitter and the incoming and outgoing link, we see that it's still at the at the core, at the center with very traditional in a certain way, media outlets that are more visible, that share more info that are more for whom the article are more shared on Twitter and on Facebook in this um, uh, in the circulation of information. Of course, we have partisan media that are more at the center left and the center, at the left and at the right, and we have also this counter informational space. But it has not the, the so uh, huge importance that it could uh, have in the public debate when we speak a lot about uh, disinformation everywhere, everywhere and every time about disinformation on this question. So this is the kind of tools that we could use in order to, to produce those, those global map of the um, circulation of information with a structural view. It could be used for different things and let's say in, in order to, to enter into the, the kind of question that we discussed today, that we, we, we have produced this uh, semantic map with 2,000 uh, articles with the word glyphosate, and uh, we could do that, we are doing that with uh, pesticide now, pe pesticide now, and um, this semantic map is gathering words because they are linked together in the uh, article, and it produces a kind of interpretation of the different uh, issue of, or sub-issue of a global issue and we have different questions about glyphosate. One of them is the Monsanto case in the, in the, in the US. We also have a lawsuit uh, against Monsanto in France. We have a large debate on words that are linked or ga gathered linked to um, controversy among experts on the non-drusiness of glyphosate. It's more linked to expertise and uh, controversy in expertise. ANSES, for example, is, is here. And then we have political discussion. We have something that is very political in the sense that we have the government, we have uh, members of parliament that are debating about agricultural model or, or about legislative decision uh, about uh, glyphosate in the French uh, discussion. And we have more 
global issue, a more global discussion about the ecological transition here, uh, about the agricultural uh, issue there. So it's a kind of map that we could use in order to project another information on it. And we could project many different things. We could, for example, see the dynamic of uh, discussion uh, from April uh, 2018 to March 2019. So we have different picture uh, of, the, of, the, of the discussion. And when it's read on the map, it's, uh, it means that this topic, that this subtopic of the, of the global issue is more important in the article that we have um, um, captured in our data. And we also can compare the way different kind of media that have been clusterized with the, the um, uh, model that I've described just before. And for example, the media from the center, hypercenter, doesn't frame the question of glyphosate in the same way as the counter information space. They are very interested by the uh, uh, debate on Monsanto here, 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 and here, and they give a lot of attention to the political discussion about uh, glyphosate in parliamentary uh, assemblies and things like that, but they don't give a lot of information about the ecological transition of the agricultural debate or the debate between experts. And if we look at another cluster of media coming from the counter-informational space, we could observe that there is more importance that is given by those outlets to uh, the controversy between experts on ecological and agricultural uh, discussion on this question. So, I just want to, to enter now for <laughs> um, the last part on the question of fake news with another way to represent this kind of global picture of the French media sphere. And we use something that is called the ideo ideological Latin space. It's a method be, uh, that has been developed by Pablo Barbera. And we use the uh, Twitter account from members of parliament and senators and we use and we try we capture the information of the people who follow the twitter account of those members of assemblies of different assemblies and then we project the um, the fact that a twitter account can be can follow one two or three different members of parliament and as soon as they are following three members of parliament we try to we gather together those uh, uh, different members, uh, parliamentarians. And so it produced a kind of multidimensional uh, ideological sphere that we could represent on different dimensions. So I, I'm <laughs> going a little fast on those questions, but if you have question, uh, methodological questions, we could discuss it further. But let's say that the two first dimension of this ideological space are at first the proximity to the French institution, the center, the political center, and the proximity to institution, or the distance uh, to uh, institution at the bottom here of the graph. And on the second axis of the graph, we have something that oppose, separate the left from the right. So we have those two dimensions, the proximity and the distance to institution on the left and the right. And we, on this kind, on this kind of, um, a Latin ideological space, we can project a lot of data that are coming from our uh, data sets and we can project the position of the different uh, members of parliament, but we can uh, project also Twitter accounts of individuals and as soon as those individuals are following some media outlets, we can also have a kind of political position of the different media of our uh, corpus of uh, uh, media. So this is a map, I am sure that you, <laughs> you, you, it's quite difficult to see the map, but it's a quite good political map of the French media sphere. Here we are at the center on link, close to the institution, the most important, the most traditional, the most institutional, the most centrist French media. Then we have the center media that I've spoke about, 
like Le Monde, Les Echos, Le Figaro are, are there on the graph. And then we have very leftist media outlets and media that are on the far right of this map. So it's an algorithmic production, but uh, media could be positioned inside this uh, latent ideological space as a way to have information about the the, po the relative position of each media among um, others, others media. And with this model, we try to position uh, articles that are being labeled as fake news by fact French fact checkers. So we use a, a large data set coming from uh, four uh, central uh, French media, Le Monde, Libération, AFP, uh, France Info, and they produce some list of um, articles and information that they label as fake news. And we try to see where does those fake news come from or, um, in, inside our ideological space. And in this graph, it's, there, it's more, the, we have a representation of Twitter users here, a lot of millions of Twitter users on this map. And we see that when it's red, it's, it's, li it, it's likely to have more fake news uh, shared by Twitter users. So we see that in the French situation, we have a lot of fake news that are shared by the far right, and most of them are shared by the far, far right or the right of the right that is here. We have also some fake news that have been shared by the um, far left in a certain way, but uh, uh, in a lesser um, um, way than for the for the far right, and we also can see the share, for example, of fact check. Fact check are article produced by those fact checker in order to say that this is a fake news, and we need to produce what is the real thing in the article. And we see that fact check are shared by the far left in the French uh, public sphere. They are also shared by the centrist and close to the institutional part of the graph. So it's, it's, it's quite a good result in a certain way. It's quite um, common with the uh, traditional literature that we could have now on the circulation of fake news. It's coming from the far right. And it's coming from a small minority of users, in fact, uh, with a very intense digital activity in the uh, digital uh, sphere. Um, and we have also the, this interesting thing, the fact that fact check has shared as a kind of competitive or agonistic discussion between two extreme parts of the politicized spectrum of the French uh, debate. So just to conclude, I, I just want to say that in the comparison between um, the US and the French, French situation and the articulation of this global picture of the media, we have two different dimensions and I think it's important for the, the, the question of fake news on related to expertise and controversy. In the US, we have a, a clear horizontal polarization of the digital public sphere. It has been shown by Johai Benkler in Network Propaganda, it's the most important book on the, the question of disinformation to, uh, for, for, for me. And they show that on the three stages, three layers of the architecture of the digital public sphere, we have this split the, between uh, media coming from, let's say, uh, Fox News or Breitbart and the other part of the very um, traditional um, um, journalist media in, in the US. So in a certain way, the polarization is something that comes from the bottom to the top. It's come even inside the uh, uh, space of the professional journalists in the US. We don't have this kind of phenomenon in France. We have a kind of, I won't say solidarity, there are strong different views on political views on the uh, issue in discussion in the public debate, but we don't have a, a different view of the reality that is coming from us in the US between Fox News and the New York Times. We have something that is more interdependent in a certain way, but we have another tension that could occur, a, a, a more horizontal, a more vertical tension between Facebook and discussion on Facebook, 
and the other layers of our architecture with Twitter on the website. And we have, uh, I don't have time to, to show you the result, but with the Yellow Vest movement, where most of the information were shared on Facebook, and sometimes, not so many, but sometimes this information were shared on Facebook by Yellow Vest uh, uh, groups or pages. We have this kind of disconnection between the center, the more traditional, the more integrated part of the social system of media production, and this conversation that occur on Facebook uh, on different situations. And it's the reason why it's so important for me to say that, in fact, this information is not something that circulates from the periphery to the periphery. It's not something, oh, it could circulate in this way, but uh, in this case, it doesn't have such an importance in a certain way. This information could have importance when people, media, professionals that have a strong visibility and are at the top of the public sphere, who are part of large media with a large visibility on a large audience, try to share information that are coming from the periphery and try to bring them into the national or the public debate. It seems to me that expert controversy are exactly this kind of question. We have uh, with digital transformation of the access to information, internet user could have access to controversy between the scientific or expertise field. So they could use those conflicts in order to produce some information that could be so disinformation in a certain way, and could convince actors coming from the center to relay this kind of information inside the public debate. We have exactly this kind of phenomenon with Professor Rao during the, um, actually with the, the COVID pandemic. And in, in many ways, uh, it's the articulation between periphery and the center that has a strong dynamic when we see with this kind of global view that I try to give you today. And uh, the articulation between center and periphery are at the heart of the production and the circulation of uh, fake news uh, today. Um, thank you. Thanks a lot, Dominique, for, for a very uh, stimulating uh, talk. And, um, and indeed, I think it gives us some uh, flavor of the uh, structural considerations that your uh, project has been exploring and it's very useful for for us. Um, so do not hesitate to, uh, to write questions or comments down uh, in, uh, in the box. I just wanted to, uh, to start. Maybe I uh, just had a clarification uh, questions maybe for everyone to understand. Uh, you mentioned something you called the uh, proximity to institutions and um, it wasn't entirely clear to me what, you, what, what was the, the expression about, so maybe you could clarify that. And I have a more uh, a general uh, reflection because um, I mean, you started your, your talk speaking about uh, counter-information and then you, um, you, you shifted a bit with uh, disinformation and, and, and fake news. And um, so I liked, uh, I liked the, uh, the discussion of counter-information and, um, and the reflection about fact-checkers because I was thinking about, I mean, what is fake news for whom, right? Are fake news, as seen from the center, things from the periphery could be fake news and maybe if you see from, from the periphery, um, those are not fake news. Those are other ways to frame the issues, for instance. So I'm, I'm a bit, uh, one, I, I guess my question is, how could you grasp the, uh, the fact that what counts as fake or true also depends on your position in, in the structure you described? Sure, sure, you're, you're <laughs> important to, 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 to say that. So. Uh, let's say, for the first question about the institutional uh, dimension, it's, it's quite complex, it's very conventional in a certain way. Uh, we, we have a multidimensional space, but we don't know how to give meaning to this different dimension, so we have to choose. And uh, the fact that we have La République en marche, the French governmental party at the top of the, <laughs> of the pyramid, and we have those two different far left and far right organization uh, is, is part of the interpretation of this institutional um, uh, dimension. At first, uh, Ethan Zuckerman, uh, with whom who, who we are work, working on this question, he, he says that there are the institutionalists at the bottom and the insurrectionalists at, at the end. It's a kind also of representation of 
the things that political scientists call populist uh, axis in a certain way. It's the kind of distance, the kind of contestations that are against institutional representation and um, elite center that are present in this in this meaning. Uh, you also write to say that there is a huge uh, problem with the word fake news. For sociologists, we don't have to, 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 to define uh, <laughs> what are fake news or not fake, uh, or not. So that's the reason why in those computational um, social science work, most of the time, just not to decide for actors what is fake or not, we use the definitions that have been produced by professionals. And so, as we have fact checkers, we use the, the label and the qualification that fact checker gave to different uh, articles. So, that's their definition. So, this definition is coming from the institutional and center part of the, of the architecture and it's uh, it's a convention and uh, convention and so that's the reason why we also have to discuss uh, if it's fake or not fake and what are the different meanings that people could attribute to this information but when we are looking just the circulation of information at a larger scale as i've done uh, during this presentation it's it's quite useful to have this uh, definition coming from the actors and um, um, not to discuss it, uh, just taking it for granted. In this um, so um, there are two two questions from the audience, and I will give the two of them to to you. Um, the first one is uh, someone asking you to, uh, to comment on the uh, fake news which has been circulated on Facebook about coronavirus and the the Pasteur Institute. If you have something to to say about that. And um, the second question uh, is asking you if you, whether you interviewed uh, journalists from uh, French media um, and, and uh, perhaps groups uh, of people on, on, on social media about the, the meaning they give to their uh, communicational practices on the internet, and maybe about whether or not they consider themselves as fact checkers. I'm adding the, the last part, but, but you can see where, where I'm going. Thanks in advance for your answer. So I answer to the first question about uh, the Institut Pasteur because we, we, we haven't done any research on this question. I think it, it will be very interesting. We, we are gathering data for the moment, but we, we, we don't have uh, analyzed uh, them. Um, yes, we, we have done some interview, not enough, in fact. It's part of the, of the future work. But it's the thing that is quite interesting always when you're producing those kind of global maps is as soon as it has been published, uh, journalists and media will say where I am on the map and they will try to discuss the position that they, they have on the map. Um, most of the time, we don't have a lot of critics. We, we, are, we have some about the, the way we, we, we position them on a specific part of the ideological lat latent ideological space. But it's also important after to have a more comprehensive sociology on that the things that PhD are doing uh, at the Media Lab now uh, in interviewing uh, journalists on the way they use social media and also in, on the way <clears throat> they cite, they decide to cite or not other media because part of the um, closer of the, the center of the public space is the fact that uh, professional journalists have learned that they shouldn't cite uh, counter-informational uh, website. And so we have this asymmetric movement that produce uh, the organization of our map because of this professional practice from the journalists. They, they just take a picture of a tweet but never a link to the uh, original information just in order not to put to produce this visibility effect that could occur if they if they produce a, a digital citation for them uh, a last uh, a, a last remark which is perhaps a, a remark that that we should reflect on for the for the whole session and perhaps for the whole ANSES conference this year it's about the, um, the you know the never ending question about the the status of, the status of facts and the very possibility to agree on facts, whether uh, in a situation where two people disagree on what facts are, is it possible to, to say that one is true and the other is false? In many 
situations, it's certainly possible. In controversial or uncertain situations, situations, it's much more uh, problematic. So I don't know if you want to react on on that, Dominic. And we, it's of, of course we go back to this to this issue. It, it's quite difficult, but it could be a, a long answer on a, a kind of metaphys metaphysical question. But but we know the situation in the U.S. with the alternative facts, uh, meaning that we could have two different realities that overlap, and uh, uh, with uh, the impossibility to 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 discuss or to to agree on on one on only one representation of of reality. But as we know, that it's more a question of frame and a question of um, interpretation that, that, that is uh, produced by, by different actors. Um, we also have to say that part of the facts are produced by the fact that sources, um, authority of different sources and the quality of the network of sources that produce that this kind of utterance could have more strengths that, and others that have not the same authority of different sources could be part of a more continuous uh, organization of the different um, um, way, uh, the different facts that have been discussed as more real, more, more factual or more false in the discussion. But it's not directly part of this discussion. We, we, we just try to uh, step on the, the definition of fact, fact check and fake that have been produced by actors in order not to interfere. Well, on a very interesting uh, we, we study to, uh, to do on okay. who those fact checkers are and how you construct yourself as a fact checker, that would be another interesting uh, issue. To finally, maybe to uh, before uh, moving on, uh, a question uh, to which we will probably go back at the, at the, during the general discussion. So uh, based on your experience, uh, how can disinformation be avoided in, in, in France? And you know, I don't know if you had uh, things to say about that. That's also an interesting question. <laughs> I, I, perhaps we, we will discuss that after after the, the different presentation. Just just to say, just one thing big related to the things that I've tried to say. That I, and I really think that it's quite important. We we need to um, to be very. Uh, sensitive to the question of the center of the digit of the public sphere so when a very uh, popular talk show um, tv broadcast channel and when a journalist with a very strong visibility on twitter on facebook and things like that uh, becomes a when they relay, they, they share information that they, they found at, at the, the periphery of the web uh, in order to produce um, uh, a strong and polemic debate at the center of the public debate, uh, we are giving, in a certain way, uh, more voice to those uh, disinformation movement. And uh, there is a kind of responsibility, in fact, of the uh, uh, traditional center of the um, the of the public sphere, and as journalists coming from the center, think that now the world is flat and uh, everything is coming from everywhere. They, they they could have the feeling, they could have the idea that they could share everything because everything is circulating everywhere. But it's not the case. That's the point that we try to explain. In fact, it's not the case. So their responsibility is is, is quite important. In this, this is the question in this of the uh, uh, democratic legitimacy of the center itself, right? Its constitutional role in uh, in our society. So it leads to um, a series of issues. We will have the uh, the opportunity to uh, to get back on during the uh, the next two talks and uh, during the general discussion. So if you have uh, other comments or questions, please do write them up in, in, in the box and we'll certainly have time to, uh, to, to come back to, to, to them. Uh, in the meantime, we can um, move on to the um, second presentation. We're very glad to, uh, to welcome uh, Lynn Freer, who is a um, professor of food and society at Newcastle uh, University. Uh, Lynn studies um, the uh, social and individual responses to risks 
particularly in areas related to, um, to food safety. Um, she's a renowned specialist of risk communication, public engagement, and um, you know, related uh, public issues. So thanks a lot, Lynn, to, um, to be with us today, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to, to talk to you today. Um, I have to say I'm, I'm getting used to uh, <laughs> this sort of meeting, um, but I would very much like to have come to Paris for the uh, original conference. So I'm going to be talking about food safety risk communication in the digital and fake news age. The first thing I'm going to say is that there's always been fake news about food safety. It just seems to have amplified uh, in the digital age because we can disseminate that information so quickly. So just to pick up on some, some key issues, there are good things about digital communication and trying to protect people's health from food safety or from other aspects of, of uh, public health. First, we can engage and involve many stakeholders across different geographical locations in interactive dialogue very quickly and equitably. We talk a lot about knowledge exchange and communication. We can do this very quickly and effectively in a way that traditional methods of consumer engagement via the mass media conferences and meetings uh, have always tried to do but can't really manage to do in real time. I think there's a question of whether we use complementary approaches or replace knowledge exchange with digital mechanisms. And I'll come back to that later. We can rapidly adapt information to the requirements of individuals and groups. It can, as we know, be highly personalized, allow for interactions with institutions, providing communication through virtual reality simulations or gam gamifications, what does the future of our agricultural landscape look like if we take particular policy decisions? And we can also understand citizens' responses, not only to the identification of emerging food safety risks, but also their preferences for different types of policy to manage those risks. We can think of here citizen science, but also social media analysis. Um, I'm just going to go back to, to trying to understand the differences between expert and citizen perceptions of risk. And we're all experts and we're all citizens in different contexts and different situations. But it's generally assumed that if somebody is acting as an expert, they tend to rely on technical risk assessments. They use scientific argumentation, which does not take account of many of the socioeconomic impacts of, of, of a particular risk, including food safety risk. And in theory, they should balance risk against benefits, but it's not always clear how socioeconomic benefits or moral issues or even technical benefits are assessed. The public use their risk and benefit perceptions to make decisions about the acceptability of risks associated with food production and indeed other technological risks. They require risk benefit communication to take account of their concerns. What is it that people are worried about? Can we use social media, for example, to understand people's fears and, and what it is that they're worried about in order to target communication mechanisms based on those concerns and fears? And the other issue 
it's true not only of digital communication, but all kinds of risk communication, is that emotional responses are important. And people use emotional responses to judge or determine the value of risk information. I think the issue here is that, first of all, emotion can be rapidly triggered and amplified within the social media and digital risk communication, not only in the case of actual risks, things that we want to discuss, but also in the case of fake news. And this is one of the reasons why fake news is so successful. So what are the advantages of risk communication in the digital age? Uh, we can use the social media analytics that we've just been hearing about to report or discuss a food safety issue. And quite often, people would not report this kind of food safety issue to the public health authorities or food producers. So we can aggregate a lot more information about an emerging food safety threat because actually for um, in infectious intestinal disease, these, the, this information is simply not conveyed to the health authorities. I, I'm sorry, Lynn, can I interrupt you just for a sec? Just if you, if you, if you want to uh, switch your camera on, that would be nice too, so that people can actually see you <laughs> when you speak. There you are. Is that OK? Um, is that all right? Oh, OK, that works. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I think there was a bit of a lag in the system. OK, sorry about that. Um, we can use citizen science and social media analysis to understand people's priorities for different risk mitigation strategies or policies. What it doesn't do is help us link up different preferences and priorities across groups of people. And in the previous presentation, we've, we've also seen that uh, there's considerable polarization which seems to be amplified in digital space. We need to recognize that not all social media discussion is geolocatable or ver verifiable. We need to understand the role of social media influences so it's better. And most of the research in this area is in relation to marketing, selling products. And to be honest, most people are interested in, in that aspect of social media. I think uh, institutions look at the, the following associated with some social media influences with all. Um, we can help the public to provide information for developing and refining public or environmental health policies. Uh, here's an example of an app for looking at the identification of emerging plant diseases. Uh, in the UK, on Saturday and Sunday, uh, there was a citizen science initiative to get people to take photos of birds in their back garden, uh, which would help them identify the species of birds that they saw, which can then obviously be analysed. And uh, there's research looking at doing this in terms of dietary preferences, crowdsourcing the nutritional and calorific content of meals, and um, also agronomic challenges, such as slow onset disaster identification. Can we get citizens or particular stakeholders like farmers to contribute data about a drought before it has a catastrophic effect. But of course, we have issues. 
You've heard about fake news and the problems associated with that. Uh, we're not that good at analysing sentiment analysis. Um, in my own research, if I'm looking at foodborne disease, uh, we often have a lot of noise because the word vomit or nausea is associated with many things that aren't food safety issues. And of course, if we're trying to communicate with the public, the role of information processing heuristics or decision rules becomes much more important given the amount of information that people are receiving. We're probably all aware of confirmation bias. People look for information that confirms what they already believe. And if we already believe a piece of fake news, we tend to look for more information that confirms that. And with reference to the previous speaker, I guess that would cover a whole range of political views. Um, I have some connectivity problems. I'm trying to uh, move on to the next slide. <laughs> okay, okay, that's it. Sorry. So the availability heuristic, the more people see information about an issue, whether it's a risk or it's fake news, uh, the more people simply believe that it's true. So it's a kind of mental shortcut that relies on immediate examples that come to a, a, a person's mind. Um, there's a mass of information, but the information that people use to make a decision is recent. They've received it frequently. It tends to be extreme, very vivid, and also people tend to focus on the negative. They process negative information more than positive information. At the bottom, I've just aggregated um, a series of images for uh, coronavirus. Uh, if you look at the first one, the sketch of the virus, we probably wouldn't have recognised that as any kind of virus had not we been exposed to the other images. The last image in the series is not about coronavirus at all. But because it's portraying a kind of sanitization, people tend to believe that whatever message is associated with that is linked to the pandemic. And of course, the effect emotion. I mentioned this earlier, discussed in the area of food safety is very, very powerful. So here are some images of disgusting foods, which people tend to recollect. If you pair this with a risk communication message, then that's likely to reinforce the extent to which people process that information. If you pair it with information which is fake, then they're also more likely to process and potentially not challenge that information. Here's some research that uh, we've been doing, uh, funded by the H2020 Suite project, looking at media reporting of the, sorry, social media discussion of the risks associated with an artificial low calorie sweetener and a naturally occurring one. We've been conducting the work, particularly looking at aspartame, the artificial one, and stevia, the natural one. We've been analysing public posts and public group information over the time period I've identified, May to September, and we've been comparing English and Spanish posts. We've been conducting some automated, but also some thematic 
sentiment analysis, which has been manual using en vivo. And what we're finding is that all the negatives in the discussion tend to be associated with the artificial sweeteners, whereas people are a lot more positive about the natural sweeteners. So I'd like to raise some concerns and issues. Coming back to the start of my talk, I think we have some problems with digital exclusion. Some population groups are inexperienced in using digital technologies. We're also seeing this, for example, in relation to agriculture and digitalization. I do some research in um, low to middle income countries such as China and Ghana, looking at farmer, small farmer adoption, farmer adoption of, of digital technologies related to satellite imagery. And what's happening is because those farmers are not experienced in digital communication, they're being excluded from markets, from access to, um, to new products and are rapidly being economically disadvantaged. But there are other groups, the elderly, those with learning difficulties, who may also fall behind. And in an area like food risk communication, it's essential that we can get information to those groups. The other issue is that information needs to be updated <clears throat> as soon as the situation changes. Digital communication tools can rapidly provide new updated information but communicators need to make sure this happens. There's one thing that we're learning is that rapid responses to an emerging food risk issue will develop trust. And this can happen very quickly by using digital communication methods. But if you get lots of disparate messages from different groups and institutions or even within the same institution, people will lose trust in the information and the message will simply be discarded. We can also use new digital technologies to develop improved consumer protection through improved tracking and tracing of foods and ingredients. And that might not only be about food safety, but could also include foods produced using, for example, methods which promote ecosystem service delivery, which are better for the environment. So let's come back to trust. I just mentioned this. People who distrust risk messages are unlikely to believe or act upon the information. This can have severe health, environmental, agri-food, trade and economic implications. Trust acts as a heuristic to help people decide whether information is trustworthy or not. So the question is, why should an individual change their food risk related behaviours if they do not trust the messenger? And I would argue that experts are no longer the most trusted sources on social media. We need to look at the characteristics of the social media influencer who is highly trusted and how this provides access to ensure that many followers receive the information and whether this extends beyond marketing products to developing an effective risk communication strategy. So another case study, crowdsourcing and emerging food risk identification. This is a systematic review which has just been completed. So at present, we know it's difficult to predict ambiguous or unknown risks from citizen data using 
automatic filters, or logarithms, or machine learning. I'm anticipating that as, uh, as the machines get cleverer, we can train them more easily. So this is a kind of point of transition where we need to have identified a known or existing food risk in order to collect data, in order to predict an emerging risk. It requires a better understanding, in particular, of human behaviour in relation to emerging food risks. And then we can just use that knowledge to further train the machines um, to, to, to try and identify how social media dialogue, how other aspects of data collection using the public might facilitate this process. We can then use that to develop policies which are more inclusive. I know that some people disagree with me. Uh, I believe that at the moment, sentiment analysis is not yet sufficiently advanced to differentiate between good, bad, and neutral. We, we need more nuanced interpretations of, of what people are saying um, to, to try and understand exactly how this relates to a potential emerging risk issue. So, some conclusions. I think, at present, it's important that we examine how to engage consumers in food safety risk issues using digital technologies. But we need to remember that not all members of the public have access to digital media. Economically disadvantaged groups, the elderly, individuals with learning disabilities, or who live in geographically remote areas might find themselves excluded from the dialogue. In a crisis situation, electronic communication channels may be disrupted. So I would argue that we still need to keep traditional communication channels active. But how do we do this, given, if you like, the overwhelming prioritization of digital communication? I'd also say that chasing fake news is an increasing problem. I know that there are various agencies, um, crowdsourcing activities being put into place to, um, to try and uh, identify fake news. But the issue is, actually, if people want fake news, what can we do to manage that? Social media in any case are rapidly evolving. So different media attract different demographic and interest groups. To some extent, we can use that information to target effective risk communication about food safety and other issues. But on the other hand, it's also something that needs to be continually monitored because it will go out of date very quickly. So monitoring the emergence and content of new media and identifying their potential audiences. And in risk communication about food safety, I think it's quite important to try and understand the potential contribution of virtual reality. What are the outcomes of future food and agricultural scenarios? What difference will, for example, vertical farming make to our landscape and how we use that? how we use that for leisure and aesthetic appreciation. And perhaps we ought to pay more attention of discussing potential agri-food policies on social media. So what do the public think about a particular policy in relation, for example, to animal welfare or in relation to ecological restoration of landscapes or, or trying to understand 
forestry development, agroforestry versus monocultures. So I think perhaps we should also look at trying to use social media as an effective public engagement tool to co-produce policy, policy initiatives. So that's my last slide and thank you for your attention. Talk and I really like the positive note at the end that maybe social media can be used for, um, for good. So um, yeah, and thanks also for getting back to, to some of those um, uh, dynamics like confirmation bias and um, the uh, availability heuristic listening to you i was wondering whether these are not uh, valid for you know every one of us even the experts themselves right and uh, and maybe we can also uh, do that sort of analysis for to um not just for, for lay people but also for, for the experts um we have uh, already a few uh, a few uh, questions um the first one is about the uh, social media influencers um their identity who they are uh, who is supporting them? To whom they are? Uh, they are trying to. Whom are they trying to include? And maybe if I can add something to these questions, thinking about uh, Dominique's uh, earlier talk, uh, are they uh, particularly positioned in a um, you know digital public space? To reuse uh, an expression that Dominique was uh, introducing. Um, I don't know, maybe social media influencers are not the same in the UK or in France, maybe they, they act differently in various uh, digital social spaces, so um, we'd be curious to have your thoughts on this. Okay, I think some social media influencers, if we look at marketing products, are actually global. So there is a space uh, for example, they link to marketing of cosmetics or superfoods where people's following is global. I think it would be perhaps very useful though, and I don't know the answer to this, to consider social media influencers very much more in this public health space. And that's where I think the local dynamics are going to be very important. We've seen from the previous talk, I think a very French context in relation to politics. And what I was taking away from that is that we have a generic approach um, where we can start understanding that kind of polarization and the kind of lock-in that people have within their own um their own peer group um and that's going to be at a local level but i think we can try and understand the process at a much more generic level i'm not sure if that answers the question but i yeah okay so i think we need a little bit more research now thank you Liam. um uh, a second question is about the uh, the possibility to have rapid responses as you uh, suggested in, in, in the talk. And um, um, so the, the question is asking you for an example of a digital communication tool of, uh, of a type of, uh, of works to maybe support those uh, rapid, rapid responses. Okay, so something I've been looking at is something like a a, either a mobile phone or a, a web-based app where we can start reporting symptoms, for example, linked to a disease outbreak, uh, which is relevant to food safety. The one that I've been looking at um, in the UK is actually very different. It's, it's looking at people reporting their health status in relation to the COVID-19 outbreak. And this is very, very useful because it allows people to report their symptoms. But as, as the situation changes, you can request additional information. For example, have you been vaccinated? Um, and uh, um, how does this relate to, 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 to other 
uh, health conditions that an individual may have. So not only is it in real time, it allows the aggregation of a lot more data than you could collect using a telephone survey or similar. And I've just had a look and I, I, I think they've had almost 5 million people participating. So that is quite a lot of very, very useful data. And sure, people might not tell the truth, but most people tell the truth. So by using that crowdsourcing approach, you're getting some very, very useful and interesting data about the progression of the epidemic. Thank you. And um, we have uh, another question about um, asking you about whether there is uh, any research on the effectiveness of different strategies, and maybe different sources, whether from the media, the government or other scientific authorities to, to address viral fake news, to address disinformation posts uh, or videos. Um, especially, and, and, and the question is pointing to a situation when there are fake news posing as a scientific discourse. And of course, there's always the, the, the issue of defining what counts as a valid scientific discourse and what is, uh, without any doubt, fake news. So I think there's a whole lot of research looking at trust in both the credibility and the honesty of different information sources. And the bulk of that research in the area of food safety risk communication has, has been done looking at the traditional media and just a, a straightforward web page, for example. Um, I think the difference here is that actually people are looking for information that reinforces what they already believe. So there, there's an issue of, let's say I believe the earth is flat. I then look for web pages that give me lots of scientific information that the world is flat. I then start to trust the source of the information. And then whatever that information source tells me, I start to believe. So I've developed that kind of heuristic processing. I think with fake news, I don't know, uh, I haven't seen research in my area, uh, other people might be able to contribute. I think with fake news, that becomes even more important. Uh, I also think that in a real emergency, people have traditionally looked to institutional sources, to the government, and somehow that is now diluting that people will look for multiple information sources. And just considering some of the fake news that we've seen with uh, COVID-19 and, and how that information is relayed and amplified through networks, um, is beginning to tell me that, at least for some people, this becomes a reinforcement of trust, that you trust those that tell you what you want to know. Finish, finish this, this part of the conversation with a, um, by going back to this issue of trust, which is absolutely central in all our uh, in, in all our discussions. Um, I, I'm reading a question uh, asking whether trust is just a matter of communication between citizen experts and, and politics um, and asking whether they're not, uh, whether, whether it's not a matter of conflicts, of conflicts of values between, between these parties. And I would add perhaps to that that maybe uh, we should think of trust as the outcome of a sophisticated uh, institutional construct, meaning that when things like fake news are propagating, maybe it's a sign that there is some work to do to, um, you know, think about what makes the uh, public institutions of expertise legitimate uh, in the eye uh, in the eye of the public in a democratic society. So um, I think we'll be happy to have your your thoughts on 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 that. And of course, that won't be the final word because we'll get back to this important question. So, and there's a lot of research that's been done distinguishing between honesty and really credibility. And I think 
whether it's digital media or not. Both are required for people to be able to respond in a positive way to the communication that you're providing. Um, so I think the issue with social media is that if people perceive you're being very honest, that tends to get them to believe the messages that you're providing. If you have expertise, but people perceive that you're not being honest or are trying to promote a particular vested interest uh, for whatever reason, that might be a policy orientation or an economic reason, that then trust is lost very quickly. And I, I know that there's a, a Dutch saying that uh, trust arrives on foot and departs on horseback. Once trust is gone, it's almost impossible to regain it. Um, so I think perhaps we need to try and consider both of those issues when trying to deliver messages based on expert knowledge within the social media as well as other media. The other issue I'm going to raise, and this is much more to do with the COVID-19 problem, is that if uncertainty is not acknowledged, then this actually looks like a lack of transparency on the part of the expert. And I think at the beginning of the discussion of the impacts of the epidemic on all of our lives, um, perhaps there was some concern about conveying uncertainty to the public. And this certainly works in other domains such as food safety risk communication, because once that uncertainty has been uncovered, then it looks as though you haven't been to try telling the truth for whatever reason. The French members of the audience know exactly what you're talking about, <laughs> considering um, the debates we had here about masks and whether or not they're effective or whether or not there are indeed uh, uncertainties about, um, about them. Um, I'm, I'm reading another question about uh, how to determine what is fake news or not, and uh, I propose that we keep these very important questions for the end, knowing that we've already started, we're already starting to um, to understand that determining what is fake news and what is not is not only an epistemological question about what counts as knowledge, but it's also a question about uh, whether or not you you trust the the sources that produce uh, that, uh, that 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 pieces of public knowledge, if you if you will. So um, there is a, a, a reflection to be conducted at all those um, all those levels, I think. Um, so let's move on to um, to uh, the uh, final presentation of, of this session, after which we'll have a, uh, a, a general discussion. So uh, our uh, final uh, presenter is uh, Josma Road, uh, who is a um, professor and researcher at the French School of Public Health. Uh, Josma has published numerous studies on public responses to health re uh, health crisis, and also on vaccines and, and vaccinations. So of course these are timely topics for our conversation today. So, uh, Josma, your, the floor is yours, and hopefully we'll manage to um, to show your slides. Yes, here they are. Okay, thank you very much, Grace, for your introduction and for the invitation. Um, to avoid some redundancy with what um, Professor Fuer told us a few minutes ago, I dramatically changed uh, my presentation. And what I would like to do is to share my experience as a member of the um, uh, expert committee at national and international level, um, especially uh, on the risk communication issues. Um, as a social psychologist, as you mentioned it, I am a specialist of the has behavior change, and it's what I want to talk about. So what I w would like to do is to share some uh, somewhat provocative idea about risk communication based on both my experience and some scientific uh, evidence. 
Uh, the first idea I would like to introduce and develop is the fact that many public health experts, uh, in my experience, still don't know what uh, risk communication refers to. Uh, the, the second idea, which is extremely important to me, is the fact that risk communication is generally not helpful as a tool to change uh, health related behavior for some reasons that I'm going to, to present to you. Uh, the third um, idea, which is maybe the most so as a more fragile idea, is the fact that we can't consider to some extent that risk communication is an oxymoron. Um, finally, I'm going to talk about some uh, risk, some side effects from risk communication because it's not only pharmaceutical intervention have uh, negative or adverse side effects, but also social intervention. And it's something which is uh, often neglected um, in, in the current literature. And this is something that's already been addressed, but I'm going to have a slightly different perspective on it. It's about uh, how heuristics um, and not complex reasoning uh, rules the behavioral world in the domain of public health. So I just want to give you a definition now because I'm not sure that everybody of you are familiar with the concept of heuristic. Um, Heuristic has been defined by the uh, German psychologist uh, Gerd Gigerenzer as um, a frugal and simple way uh, to make a decision or to make judgment in a complex world. So we are talking about her, her intuition, how they work. So my, my first idea, and I think it's important to start with the definition because some, sometimes we don't know what we are talking about. And it's an experience I had in many uh, expert groups. Um, in, in the current literature, uh, risk communication often refer to actually a flow of information about, about risk evaluation, which pack and force between experts, the regulatory institution or practitioner, some internal group, and the general public. It's a relatively uh, whole definition because it's come from the uh, early 90s. It was provided by Professor Otwil uh, who has uh, been a long collaboration uh, with ANSES. And what uh, Professor Ren um, uh, explained us is the fact that we need to uh, understand that um, risk communication is not an on-way process. It's an iterative process uh, between some sources, some transmitter, and some receptor. So, uh, in the age of the digital revolution, of course, this uh, uh, difference in the conceptualization of uh, source on the one hand, transmitter on the other hand, it can, can be totally questioned, in my opinion. But uh, the definition is, to some extent, still robust and, and, and relevant. So what I observe um, in my experience of this committee is the fact that most of the time, we are confounding uh, risk communication and persuasive communication. And it's something I found, even at the highest level uh, in the public health expertise. Uh, for example, the ID, uh, after the relative failure of uh, the vaccination campaign in 2009 against uh, uh, the H1N1 influenza, is the fact that if we didn't succeed to uh, convince people to get vaccinated, it's because we poorly communicate about that. And I'm not sure it's sufficient as an explanation. And the conclusion um, of, the, of the experts who studied and thought about uh, this failure is the fact that uh, we don't know how to persuade people to change their behavior and to to adopt health shares behavior. And for them, it was one of the biggest challenge. And this is relatively uh, surprising in my opinion, because we have, a, there's a lot of evidence now that communication is a very poor way to, to change behavior and to convince people to change their behavior. Uh, first of all, there's a large range uh, of communication in the public health domain. Uh, risk communication is only one type mm -hmm. of communication we can use, but there's also uh, there's a lot of different kind of communication between the personal com communication, the institutional communication, the verbal communication, the nonverbal communication. There's a large range of communication, and maybe uh, they have uh, a too narrow conception of communication that should be uh, question. 
so the so, so next point is uh, is that most of the case risk communication is generally not very helpful to change health um, related behavior. It's true in many domains, and if I if I just uh, give an example from my uh, field of expertise, which is uh, vaccination and infectious disease, uh, we had uh, a few uh, systematic uh, review of literature, which clearly show that um, improving information about the risk and benefits from vaccination has absolutely no effect on uh, the vaccine uptake or even on intention to be vaccinated. And it's something we probably uh, forgot this last uh, weeks well, now that we are um, starting implementing this new campaign of vaccination in many countries. So communication, communicating is, is not enough. Uh, but it's not, only, it's not only true uh, in the field of vaccination or in emerging infectious disease. It's also true uh, in the prevention, for the prevention of obesity. Um, I was very interesting interest to, to read um, a report by um, uh, the previous director of the International uh, Obesity uh, Task Force. And they, him and his group of experts just came to the conclusion that providing even individualized advice to the people to like reduce their uh, food intake or to have more exercise, it's extremely uh, extremely poor way to, to obtain some change uh, in the population. So it's not only true um, in the field of exercise, it's also true in the field of uh, obesity and overweight prevention. So what we know um, in the psychology uh, field is the fact that um, in general, to obtain uh, or to promote some change in the population, we need to um, uh, we need to activate three main factors. So the first factor, and we need to, to be sure that all these factors are um, activated if you want to, to to succeed in the promotion of change, behavioral change. The first one is to be sure that people have the capacity to understand uh, what are the challenges. So it's both the mental capacity to understand what are the risks and the benefit, for example, of a vaccine, and also uh, the physical capability, capability to, to, to uh, do something. If you are talking about physical activity, for example, some people have some, um, are disabled, so they don't have this capacity to move. And the same for um, the migrant, for example. We have, uh, in many countries, many developed countries, we have a community of migrants who don't speak the language of the country. So if we want them, if you want to be sure that they are able to understand what are um, the risks and the benefits of a certain action, we need to be sure that they are able to understand one we want to explain them. And it's something which is most of, not all the time, but often uh, neglected. So the second factor is the motivation to, to act. Uh, I will develop this idea a bit later. It's the fact that uh, motivation is divided in two kinds of, of motivation, which is a reflexive uh, uh, motivation and the impulsive vaccination. It's something uh, which has been already addressed to some extent by Professor Fuhrer, but I think it's important to keep this idea in mind that we have two kinds of motivation and they don't depend on the same factor. The, the last um, factor, which is extremely important, if you want to um, transform some intention or, or inaction, is the fact that we need to give opportunity um, to the people to adopt uh, a specific behavior. That means that we need to design the environment so that uh, the um, desired behavior is more easily uh, adopted by the people. So my, my, my next idea is about the fact that risk communication is often an oxymoron. So what does it mean? Um, if you look at all the documents, uh, all the information that are provided, for example, by the public authorities, it, you have to notice that most of them uh, use some concepts uh, that are extremely hard to, to understand for many people. For example, the the, the concept of relative risk, the concept of uh, absolute, absolute risk, the concept of probability, 
of odds or the ratio, all these concepts, uh, people are not familiar with them. And they are extremely difficult to, to, to understand and to grasp with. So what, what we did in a recent study is we tried to measure, it has been done in many countries uh, this last year, but we tried to, to do the same uh, task in France. We uh, use uh, a questionnaire to measure the, the level of numeracy. Um, so numeracy is uh, the capacity to understand, interpret, and use some basic uh, concept in probability and statistics. So the kind of question we use are the following one. We use, uh, in general, we use 10 questions, about 10 questions in this kind of survey. Here, I just present you five of them. So uh, I just uh, want you to, to have a look on this question. So this seems apparently relatively easy. It seems to be uh, an easy task, like uh, to apply some basic principle of probability and statistic to um, um, everyday uh, problems, for example. And, the result uh, that we obtain in the French population is that, as you can see on, on the right side um, on, the, on the graph, is the fact that in the general population in France, uh, the mean score is just slightly above uh, the average score, which is five, five in 10. And that means that about half of the French population is not very comfortable uh, with this kind of task. It is not comfortable with this kind of uh, um, concept uh, used in risk communication in a large extent. And just to let you know, um, there is an extremely uh, clear impact of uh, the numeracy on the risk perception. When we ask very simple question about what is the prevalence of cancer in France? In um, on 100 French, how many of them uh, have a cancer right now? And we, when we have this kind of question, it's very really interesting to, to observe that the higher um, numerate people in France they are absolutely or just slightly biased in their judgment. But if we look at the um, lower numerate people, uh, which has a score lower than five, they are extremely biased in the way they estimate um, the prevalence of a range of disease, of very common disease in, in France. So there is both uh, an association between the numeracy and the capacity to understand uh, some message, but also to transform uh, your observation of the real world in relatively uh, relevant and uh, accurate uh, statistics. The good news, um, but well, actually it's both a bad news, it's a good news. The good news is we have developed in the field of psychology, of psychology some tools to improve the capacity of uh, slightly low numerate people to understand some risk communication, some risk message. And this is something which has been largely used both uh, in Australia and in the United Kingdom. Um, it's what is called the natural frequencies. And with the natural frequency, we are able to communicate the risk uh, without using some very complicated concepts uh, like uh, percentage um, uh, probability. And here, people are just able to interpret this data in a correct way without um, a huge effort, huge cognitive effort. Um, so I'm really, really surprised that this last month we didn't use this kind of tools uh, in France because I, I didn't see any um, natural frequency use in the communication provided by the institution or by the government. And I think we should consider the opportunity to use more uh, this kind of tools, which is, in my opinion, extremely easy to use and um, it's on a, from a democratic perspective, a very important way of communicating uh, risk. Um, one of the other ideas uh, I would like to share with you is the fact that it's not only pharmaceutical uh, intervention we could have some uh, adverse side effects, but it's also social intervention. And in my field of research, we uh, implemented and developed a lot of experiments about the effects of uh, communication on decision making related to health and disease um, topics. And what we found in this result is 
sometimes some extremely surprising or counterintuitive results. And this is especially true when you are talking about uh, vaccination, because what the people, uh, what the researcher found is the fact that uh, messaging is actually doesn't work as we intended it was supposed to work. And the effectiveness of this message work on the people who are already convinced that, for example, the vaccine is safe and the vaccine is useful, but on the people who have different conception of the world, who have different views um, on vaccination, we can observe some uh, backfire effects. The fact that we can even increase the rejection of uh, vaccination when we try to convince them that it's important for them to get vaccinated or to vaccinate their children, for example. And something we, uh, which is extremely neglected, in my opinion, in when we are considering um, social intervention. Um, another reason why we should be careful and cautious about uh, risk communication is the fact that sometimes, due to a um, relatively well-documented effect, which is called the risk compensation effect, this is the fact that when we are communicating, when we are communicating information about the fact that uh, we have an effective intervention for something like for uh, avoiding uh, HIV infection, or we have a vaccine against um, uh, SARS-CoV-2, for example, well, what this kind of information could trigger is the fact that people are likely, some people, not of them, but some people are likely to relapse their uh, existing uh, health protective behavior. So that's mean, for example, they use less condom. It has been observed um, during the, the late 90s in many countries. And it's also true uh, beyond the infectious disease field, because I, I found ex some uh, extremely interesting result from uh, the literature about prevention of uh, overweight and obesity. And this is a experimental study conducted by uh, both an American and a French scientist, which is um, measuring the effect of the low fat nutrition label. And what they found was relatively counterintuitive because they found exactly that. This is the fact that when you give to people some low fat product, well, actually, the are likely to consume more calories at the end of the day. And it's not, it's not only true for the overweight or obese consumer, but also for the normal weight consumer. When we know that the product is uh, low fat or low sugar food product, people uh, compensate this risk by consuming more calories. So sometimes we are losing uh, the positive effect of having better uh, products. And this is an effect that's extremely uh, important to, to consider. Um, my, my, one of my last points is about the heuristics, so the simple and frugal uh, way of making a decision or making a judgment that we use intuitively. Um, what we know about uh, this heuristic is the fact that um, her in her human behavior, uh, most of the time intuition comes first and complex reasoning comes second. And most of the time, complex reasoning are actually serving our gut feelings. It's uh, uh, the, the, it's, it's um, American psychologist, John Heider. He, he said that um, the intuitive system is just a, ma just a master and the deliberative system um, is rather uh, the, the, the slave or her patient. And, to some extent, sometimes her behavior are driven by this heuristic, and in many contexts, they make us smart because we have evidence that it's extremely functional in many uh, situations, but in some situations, that make us really irrational and uh, sub-optimizing some decision. So if I want to illustrate my purpose, I, I will say that um, in many cases, we can have a conflict of rationality when we activate both the reflexive and uh, the impulsive system. And even if you educate people, if you uh, inform them, educate them to the way to lose weight, for example, when they are exposed to this kind of very uh, palatable food, which are extremely attractive for most people on a universal way, 
Um, in general, the impressive system um, is uh, stronger. It's the one who finally uh, brings the decision in many people. And this kind of experiment has been conducted in Cambridge, um, uh, among other, and they clearly show that even after a conference about how to deal with your, your impulsive system, how to be better in your food decision, uh, if you offer to these people after uh, the conference uh, a buffet with this kind of product, most people just don't respect their whole intention and they don't use the principle they are familiar with now. So just to give you an uh, some example of heuristics uh, that are activated in the phrase of risk. Um, the first one, one of the most interesting, in my opinion, is what is called the preference for statu quo. Um, this is the fact that um, in complex situations, when people don't know what to do, well, actually, they don't do anything more than what they are used to do. So there is a, a sort of tolerance for negligence. That means that we are uh, doing the same. The next heuristic which is extremely important when you are considering social media is what is called the tribalism or loyalty to groups and community. When people don't know uh, how to make a decision or how to make a judgment because it's time consuming, because it's energy consuming, because it's require uh, some cognitive research, some time to find the information, for example, what they are, they are likely to do is just to refer to what is the prominent or dominating opinion or behavior in their community or in their reference group. And it's a very powerful uh, trend in many societies. The next um, heuristic, which is extremely frequent, is uh, preference for autonomy and freedom of choice. We don't like to be constrained by some regulation. Most of the time, we prefer to have the choice to do something rather than to be limited in our choice. But uh, the evidence shows that in many cases, it's an extremely uh, an efficient uh, way to, to proceed, to just leave people with an autonomy of choice. And it's, of course, it's raised some democratic uh, questions uh, that have to be addressed. But it's interesting to, to just see how people uh, react in such situation. Um, a very important heuristic, uh, which has already been mentioned earlier, it's a naturalistic um, heuristic. This is the fact that most people are likely to think that natural products are better or safer, better for health, and safer than manufactured products. And it's not necessarily true in many uh, domains. I just want to show you an example later. And one of the uh, final um, heuristic, which, which is extremely important in terms of risk communication, is the fact that we have a preference for negative information. We are better to memorize the negative information rather than the positive information. So uh, negativity uh, attracts her attention, and it's especially true in the social media. So just to illustrate my, my purpose, this is a, a truck I saw when I was uh, in New York a few years ago. It's clear that um, the, the lobbyists uh, tried to activate this preference for autonomy and free choice in many uh, circumstances. Like here, when uh, the authority in New York wanted to limit the size of the portion of uh, the soft drinks, for example, there was a huge campaign of advertisement to promote the, the uh, freedom of choice in New York, and, and I think it's something which is extremely common for lobbyists to, to promote um, freedom of choice when sometimes we have to uh, to limit people. Um, my next um, heuristic is what is called the naturalism heuristic, uh, because it's something extremely common now in the press, and as you can see here, I'm sorry it's in French, but it's ext extremely easy to understand. It's natural or toxic. It's the idea if something is natural, it's not toxic, and if something is not natural, it is toxic. So there is a sort of equivalence between the toxicity of the product and the naturalness of the product, which is extremely wrong on a, from a toxicologic perspective. Uh, because what we know from uh, toxicology is the fact that in many cases, natural chemicals are, can be much more harmful than some scientific uh, chemicals, for example. And of course, this uh, heuristic of naturalism is extremely uh, uh, 
uh, or widely used by uh, the people in the advertisement domain. And as you can see here, uh, a long time ago, in the 50s or in the 60s, um, the fact that cigarette was natural was a way to promote uh, the consumption of uh, tobacco uh, in the United States. So we have a lot of very harmful products um, which are totally natural and virus are some of them. So the, the last heuristic I want, I would like to, to mention and to just uh, explain to you is the um, negative heuristic, the fact that um, we are much more interested and stimulated by some negative information. When in some experiments you just present to people positive and negative information about something, for example, about the risk and benefits from uh, eating fish or, um, or, or, um, or other product, um, seafood, seafood product, for example, um, we can see that in a few weeks later, when we question them again about what are the risks and the benefits of the fish consumption, in a country like France, um, the people, the subject, uh, better memorize the risk associated with fish consumption and not the large benefits we have, uh, including the, uh, the intake in omega-3, uh, which are uh, an important issue in nutrition right now. So, uh, to conclude, and last but not least, what I could say is, um, People are biased to some extent in many uh, decisions, but we should not conclude that they are irrational when they face risk. And we are learning a lot about this natural experiment, which is uh, the, ac the actual and current pandemic of COVID-19, because what we observe in a country like France is the fact that um, the health protective behavior are totally proportional to the incidence of the disease in the population. If you look at this graph here, um, so this is uh, the frequency of the most recommended uh, health protective behavior in France, like uh, washing your hand frequently, or, or later using a fast, uh, fast mask in blue, for example. As you can see is that when there is an increasing of the incidence of the disease in the population, people are more likely to adopt uh, health protective behavior and to engage this kind of behavior. But when this incidence is declining, they are more likely to relapse their protective behavior. So to some extent, they are extremely uh, adaptive. They, they, they um, adopt some adaptive behavior. They um, dedicate more uh, resource and attention to the problem when there's a increasing risk and they are paying less attention to the risk when it's decreasing, which is extremely uh, adaptive in my opinion. So to conclude, we are learning a lot about health protective behavior from this experience. And I'm sure that we have uh, um, a lot to, to discuss in the next few months. Thank you very much for your question. I'm ready for the question and discussion. Uh, for this very stimulating talk and uh, I think it raises a number of, of questions. So I, I just wanted to um, to raise a few uh, provocative issues, uh, so to speak, reacting to your uh, very uh, interesting uh, elements. First, I wanted to, to have your opinion about what, what it means to frame issues in terms of risks, because it's not neutral, right? I mean, if you ask the problem of GMOs as a matter of measuring uh, environmental risks, for instance, and not as an issue of whether or not you want GMO at all, or whether or how you should organize the uh, industrial uh, systems for, for food products, then, you know, that seems already a, an important choice. So I'd be curious to have your opinion on that. And the, the other thing is uh, maybe about the uh, uh, something we already touched upon uh, listening to, uh, to Lynn Fleur. It's the, the uh, opposition between complex reasoning and gut feelings. So on the one hand, there is certainly gut feelings in the in the words uh, in the work of experts, and there are certainly intuitions, and there is certainly uh, feelings and and what have you for, for experts. And on the other hand, even if there is something as gut feelings, it's I'm pretty sure it would be possible to find some some form of rationality in the decision we make, as you said in your last slide. So I'm wondering whether the uh, dichotomy between uh, reflective and impulsive, between complex reasoning and gut feelings, is in itself the product 
of a particular experimental device in psychology precisely. So it allows us to do a certain number of things, but it might also have other more negative consequences. So I'm saying that we already have uh, other questions, but I'll leave you uh, with, with those remarks before going to, uh, to the other questions. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you for your question. I think we could uh, answer to your second question uh, with uh, Lynn Fuer because she's as competent as I am uh, on this topic. So maybe it would be better to share uh, the, the answer to your question. Um, concerning the framing, I think you're right. It's it's a very uh, strategic uh, uh, issue because what we observe um, during the last few months is the fact that when we are talking about vaccination, the dominant framing for a long time from, let's say, September to December was clearly what are the side effects of the vaccine? What are the risks of being vaccinated against uh, COVID-19? And as long as we are waiting for um, the, the data from the experiments uh, from the, uh, in the population, um, I will say that I didn't calculate it precisely, but I was reviewed the press and the media coverage. I would say that about 75% of the articles were about, is there any side effect with this new technology? What's, uh, what are the potential risks? Uh, what about the allergy? And so the framing were exclusively on the risk uh, of this product, but not on the potential benefit. And suddenly it was extremely uh, both rapid and uh, uh, major, important, we can see how uh, in January, uh, under the, the impact of the discourse of some opinion leader, like uh, Professor Khan, for example, the, uh, the framing of the problem radically changed and we, we, uh, we treat not only the risk of the vaccine, but also the risk of not being vaccinated and what are the benefits of the vaccination. And, it was impressive because immediately what we observed in our survey is the fact that in a few days, in a few weeks, uh, we gained like uh, 50 or percentage point, percentage point of people which were uh, ready and who intended to, to get vaccinated. So uh, now more than 55% are okay to get vaccinated and it was about 40% um, in uh, December. So I think uh, Potentially, the framing has a huge effect on what is called the uh, inaction or indecision. People are um, more ready to, to wait for ma before making decision because they are just framed by the. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just say that um, um, we we observe potentially a very uh, important impact of the change uh, in the framing of the vaccination between December and um, January, because uh, we observe an um, uh, important increasing in the intention to get vaccinated from 40% to 55% uh, in this time. Thank you. Uh, I'm seeing two questions that can be, that can maybe be uh, regrouped together. Um, it's um, if, so sure. if, you, if you if we accept what you just said about the importance of the heuristics and the uh, the difficulties uh, that risk communication uh, faces, then what do we do, right? Uh, so is there a way of uh, doing uh, of changing communication uh, in a way that could uh, circumvent those uh, those issues, or maybe is it possible to do something completely different? So, for instance, uh, using nudges as a particular um, uh, stream of works in economics, but also uh, some policy programs are trying to are trying to do. So what are your thoughts on, on this? Yeah, it's something I try to address um, in the beginning of a presentation, the fact that um, motivation are only one factor in the decision making process. So by communicating about risk, we try to improve or to increase the motivation to act. But it's only one of the parameters in this complex equation. So um, another possibility, and sometimes it's better if we uh, um, intervene at the same time on the three, on the three factor, it's also to increase 
the material opportunity to, to act. And that means that we can modify or to alter the environment in which we are evolving. Um, we have a lot of experiments based on Nudge. Um, Nudge is a new concept for very whole ID, which is uh, the half ordinance ID that we, uh, when we change the architecture of choice, uh, like what is uh, the choice by default, for example, we can improve um, uh, uh, significantly uh, the, the kind of decision. Um, one of the examples in the field of environment is the fact that when you explain to the people uh, that, for example, the average consumption of electricity is such a number, and you show them that there are above this number or um, under the, uh, below this number, it's extremely um, powerful in terms of, so, term of social norms. So it has an effect uh, on the behavior of people that have been measured in many experiments. So of course, information is important, but information is only one of the parameters which could uh, improve the environment. And I think it's something which is um, uh, it's going to be done probably in the next few months because, uh, as I as I know, uh, we will have the opportunity to get vaccinated in the pharmacy in, in France against uh, uh, the COVID-19 because we have pharmacy absolutely everywhere in this country. So it's going to be extremely easy just to go to the pharmacy to get vaccinated there rather than to have an appointment with your doctor, then to go to a center of vaccination. And it can be extremely complicated sometimes vaccination, especially in France. So I think we, we can do better in, on the environment, the material environment to, to, to promote some of the behaviors. Which is a basic yeah. idea. Thank that. you, thank you, Josna. There are two other questions that we'll take before moving to the uh, the to the general discussion. Um, so there is um, an interesting question about uh, international comparison. So you mentioned some of the uh, elements you mentioned might be situated in particular nation states. So, for instance, the the the, the idea that certain risks are uh, perceived and not uh, not benefits, or something some risks are memorized and not others, as in your fish example, might be different. Uh, in certain in, in in other countries, and there is another uh, interesting uh, question about the um, whether or not the the works the work being done by fact checkers and debunkers about vaccination uh, and and vaccines is effective and uh, and to whom whether or not it has an effect in convincing people that vaccination is safe or, or necessary. And I think it goes back to some of the points that you were raising. Yeah. Earlier. Yeah, I think fact checking is extremely important from a democratic perspective uh, as a tool to improve uh, the, the debate, the public debate. But what we know from the experiments that I mentioned in my talk is the fact that uh, in many cases, um, providing information uh, about the correctness of some uh, behavior or decision or ideas can be counterproductive for many people. That means that it's like the human system. The cognitive system is likely to defend against uh, some uh, uh, contradictory ideas. And what we have observed is it's relatively ineffective um, on the people who are convinced that they should not be vaccinated, for example. So uh, in general, this kind of tools or uh, information is useful for the people who are hesitant, who are um, we are balanced between the risk and the benefits from the vaccination or not being vaccinated. And in general, it has an effect on this kind of people. But in, in my knowledge, I, I didn't see any experience that shows that we can change the opinion of people who are convinced by the, um, side, the existence of side effects, major side effects of vaccine, for example on to the uh, to the final uh, discussion because I'm, I'm reading yeah. uh, a question about bias and uh, and uh, as, well about the fact that people are biased uh, which I think uh, will uh, we can have interesting inputs from the uh, from the other uh, presenters so 
Um, maybe Natalie can. Move. Oh yeah, right. That was what I was going to ask. Thanks. Uh, thank you. So, so I wanted to to ask the uh, the three of you maybe to reflect on this uh, on this idea of bias. If we accept that everybody is biased, I mean, all the, uh, everyone is biased, right? All the the experts are biased. Public is biased, and um, and it it doesn't mean that that people are irrational. It doesn't mean that people are just moved by emotions and you know what, what goes through their through their head at a certain time. Uh, what do we do? How do you, is it is it possible to conceive of this bias in a virtuous way, uh, so to speak? To to think that every knowledge, whether expert or lay, is uh, situated, has to be connected with certain ways of framing the question. So, uh, is it possible to uh, to to conceive of a situated knowledge characterized by the main, many bias that that it that it has um, that it has? Um, in, in a virtuous way, in, in a way that would be beneficial for, uh, for a democratic society. So, Dominique, if you want to, do you want to, to, to start on that? <laughs> Excuse me, uh, is it okay now? Uh, yes, I hope it, it's okay. So, uh, it's, of course, it's a very interesting question. The, the, the fact is that we are biased since a lot of time. In fact, it's not new. I think that the, the, the new configuration now is the fact that with the rise of the uh, behavioral and psychology approach in, in many different ways, we are more um, focused on this idea that we have bias. But in the traditional media theory, we have this idea of selective exposition. And we know that selective exposition is linked to personal attributes of each individual, some personal point of view, and perhaps it, it's a way to have the discussion because I, I, I really uh, like the, the, the discussion about um, different kind of anthropological view of the subject in a certain way. We could have this idea of impulsive and re reflexive uh, a psychological subject, and perhaps that's uh, the, the debate about fake news and the bias biased uh, perception of information and communication um, could be uh, framed differently by sociologists. And uh, as we discuss about the epistemic frame of fake news and saying that it's a quite conventional and constructed categories by produced by fact checker and central um, producer of information in the in the public space, we know that and that's the thing that I try to show that if uh, people will share the more, who well, are more likely to share those are uh, far right uh, individuals, it's because it's not an epistemic question. In fact, it's something that is linked to the production of identity. And in the production of identity, uh, the question of the uh, factuality or epistemic verification of information is, is not something important for people, and that's part of our discussion uh, today. But we use a lot of heuristic in order to produce our identity. And I, I really like the idea that we, we have identity, uh, heuristics that comes just in order to, to think that this part of the information correspond to some things that I want to believe, that I want to share, that are important for me to uh, uh, produce my identity and to share it with others. And uh, uh, perhaps I will have a question for Jocelyn, because how do uh, new heuristic emerge, emerge in, in our society? Because we, we have this uh, heuristic about your, your, uh, natural and toxic uh, that appears. And I really think that in part of the debate about this information, we have a new heuristic that comes that that I don't know how to formulate it, but it could be something as every information or message that is coming from elites uh, is corrupted. And um, it's a new frame in order to uh, interpret information and to uh, uh, define yourself in front of the communication message that are coming that is more and more present in our society, and it's a kind of, for me, both psychological and ideological way to uh, um, produce meaning and to understand information in our society. 
against that uh, it, it can't be just an issue of risk communication, of communicating a body of knowledge. It's also about uh, ensuring the conditions under which uh, certain institutions or certain people are seen are you know, legitimate uh, uh, representative of, of a certain factual uh, reality. Um, Josna, as uh, Dominic asked you a question, maybe you can um, you can speak now, and we'll uh, we'll finish with Lynn. Uh, well, thank you, Dominic, for your very uh, relevant question. I think it's uh, something we should um, uh, talk more about when, when we are addressing uh, heuristic and bias. I think one of the common error is to think that heuristic equal uh, cognitive bias. It's two different things. And in many cases, we have experiments uh, showing that heuristics are extremely effective to resolve a lot of problems uh, in uh, the archaic world, for example. And we save energy, we save um, information, treatment, uh, we, we save time, and we, in many cases, we are able to obtain satisfying uh, results from this kind of uh, reasoning. Uh, but in some cases, we can, uh, for true, uh, having some cognitive bias in the, in the sense that uh, the decision we make are not as good as the one we could uh, obtain from a more deliberative uh, uh, decision-making process, for example. So I, I just want to um, uh, develop another idea that you mentioned, which is extremely important in my opinion. It's the fact that uh, heuristic is not necessarily a biological process. It's a can, heuristic can be based on a cultural worldview, for example. It's really interesting. If you compare the Vietnamese population um, with the French population, uh, the idea is natural, of natural things in Vietnam is associated with danger and something risky. So uh, when you have a food crisis in Vietnam, people like um, with uh, avian flu, for example, people are consuming more products from the industrial uh, um, industry and from, and from the supermarket. Why in France, you just have the opposite trend. When you have a crisis uh, with, um, with uh, the chicken, for example, you have an increasing of the, um, uh, of the small business uh, production, for example. But, so it's really interesting to see how um, the, the development, the spread of some cultural worldview in, in her world this last 30 years about the idea of nature has transformed the way you, you, we use some uh, heuristic uh, and how we um, make decisions uh, based on this kind of criteria. So I think it's it's how we can combine maybe uh, the sociology and the anthropology and the psychology on the other side because there is um, some possible interaction between the two uh, the two domain when we are examining some decision of the uh, of the session but uh, we should uh, uh, that lean has uh, have the final word okay so the one thing I'm going to say is that we need to remember we are at this stage. I'm also looking at the WHO of risk communication, which is the interactive range of information between different stakeholders. And in that context, if I come back to the discussion of bias, if we understand people's biases, as actually a way of prioritizing their interests, we can perhaps also inform the kind of policy processes and communication activities in which we're engaging about risk. So the example that was just provided about Vietnam versus France and the naturalness and the uh, artificial preference, how that switches over in a, in a crisis. And that clearly demonstrates the social embeddedness of how heur heuristics arise. But at some meta level, the existence of heuristics and how they operationalize can help us understand the way the world is. And one final comment, 
you know, there are some things that we really do need to roll out, COVID vaccination programmes, for example. And at that point, it's probably a very good idea to try and understand how different opinions are formed, how fake news arises in the context of social media in a more, if you like, um, a way that is embedded with the priorities and preferences of the public. So why are people creating fake news? We haven't really discussed that. I don't know why. If anybody else does, I'd be really happy to have a conversation about it, because to me, that, that's the fascinating question. That, 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 that opens up a range of interesting questions for, uh, for future discussions. I think there is a, a rich uh, area of, of study that we, as, as a collective, might want to, uh, to look into. So, um, well, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dominique, Jocelyn and Lynn, for very exciting uh, presentations and, and lively discussions. Thanks a lot uh, to uh, the organizers of the uh, entire a symposium and this uh, particular uh, session. Just uh, a few words to tell you that this session has been uh, recorded and the, uh, it will be made uh, available to all the uh, participants who registered uh, to, uh, to the symposium. So we'll, you will have the opportunity to uh, rewatch the, uh, the session. And there will be uh, other sessions uh, next week in February and the 8th and 9th, I think. Yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, for, uh, and that will be the two final dates of the ANSES Symposium. So I encourage uh, every one of you to, uh, to look at the program and, uh, and uh, connect to, uh, to the next uh, seminars. Uh, under, under that particular format. So uh, thanks a lot to, to, to the three of you, and uh, I hope we'll have uh, many other opportunities to continue those exciting conversations, hopefully uh, seeing each other in real and not just through a screen. Uh, thanks a lot, and um, have a good night. Thanks. <laughs>